Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome to the second appointment of the course Healing Words. This is the program of this evening. The topic is uh, parental reading. I will just introduce the topic with a couple of slides and then I will give the, the floor to the, to the speakers. Why we read? Well, uh, of course, for pleasure and, and inter entertainment, also for learning or to be informed or sometimes to have a guide but also as we discover in the lesson of today and in the next one less obvious to promote our health and promoting health must start in childhood We have to understand the difference between reading and storytelling. In direct reading, a two-way relationship is created between the author and the reader. Instead, in listening a reader, the relationship is between the listener and the reader. This relationship is even stronger if the reading is dialogic. It, it asks uh, the reader tries to involve the listener in the story. And the relationship with the author of the text is indirect now and is mediated by the reader. Oral speech has a special power, which was uh, known already by ancient Greek philosophers. For example, according to Plato's uh, view, oral speech is compared to a science that is indelibly written in the soul. This aspect makes parental reading very important for the child's neuropsychological development. Cognitive skills associated with storytelling, such as memory, creativity, comprehension, and language, enhance synaptic development of the brain. This is why shared parental reading at a very early age has, assume, has assumed great importance in pediatrics. We will hear about all this from two speakers, Perry Klaas from New York, special guest, and also Oscar Yenny, other special guest, from Zurich, who will uh, speak, uh, Oscar Yeni will act as a discussant. Now let me introduce uh, a world-class scientist, Professor Perry Klass. Perry Klass is a professor of journalism and pediatrics at New York University. She attended Harvard Medical School and completed her residency in pediatrics at Children Hospital, Children's Hospital in Boston. As a journalist and a writer, she is a, the author of many books of fiction and non-fiction, short story, essays, and journalistic articles. She writes regularly on the New York Times with a weekly column, The Checkup, for the science section. And uh, her articles appeared in a wide range of of uh, journals, including Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker, but also in a higher uh, reputed medical journal like the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I mentioned her uh, recent book, The Best Medicine, How Science and Public Health Gave Children a Future. This book describes how victories over infant and child mortality have changed the world. It's a very nice book. But the job that uh, best qualifies her for being uh, here tonight is being the National Medical Director of Reach Out and Read, an organization that works across pediatrics to promote early literacy through reading aloud by parents or caregivers. 
And she became involved, as she will explain uh, in uh, Reach Out and Read, when uh, it was a single program in one hospital. Thanks to her, now uh, the, the program is a national program present in, in, in a thousand of locations in US, in, in all US, and also now in, uh, now, starting from 20 years ago in Europe, and also here in Switzerland. She has also lived in Florence and, uh, and uh, teach the, in Florence at New York University campus, um, and uh, has received numerous uh, awards and honorship honors that are too many to be listed now to, to, for, for the problem of the time. So, Professor Class, dear Perry, uh, we are honored by your presence. The stage is yours, please. Thank you. It's an honor, a great honor for me to be here, and also a great joy. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you. Literacy, very important. Um, eh, buonasera, è eh, un onore anche per me. Um, I'm going to talk about parents reading and how it builds and changes the brains of children. I've put some of the slides into Italian as well as English so we can all try different kinds of reading while I talk. But before I start talking about neurodevelopment and our more modern concept of what reading does. I'm showing you a painting by Raffaele, a Madonna and a child and a book. And I would ask you to look at what the painter, Raffaele, is interested in here. He's interested in where is the baby looking and where is the mother looking. He's painting aspects of a relationship in which they are looking in the same direction in which the mother is following the child's gaze. He's showing us 500 years ago that holding a book, a mother and a baby are actually interacting. They're picking up signals from one another. And in fact, I have, it will not surprise you, I will have a very large collection of reading Madonnas because as you know, for hundreds of years, if you want to look at a painting of a baby, this is the baby that you look at. I'm going to jump though from these paintings, from these Renaissance paintings, to a modern image. Here you have a mother, a child, a book, and also a pediatrician because what I'm going to talk about is why the idea of reading aloud in pediatrics, in primary care pediatrics, has become so important. What do we think we can do by bringing books into that examination room, into that clinic? What do we think we can accomplish? We think that by helping parents understand how important it is to read aloud to young children, we can increase the children's exposure to language. We can increase, and you just heard in the introduction, about the, the interaction, the dialogue, the question and answer, and positive interactions. We think we can help families build routines. We think we can help children learn the skills that they'll need to succeed in school. And we also think that emotionally, we can help families build in moments of security and safety, which will help children develop resilience and which will help them survive even if they are growing up in circumstances of toxic stress. Because reading aloud every day with young children creates these, these warm, positive, language-rich childhood experiences. So the program Reach Out and Read, we will be 35 years old next year. 
It began as a collaboration between pediatricians and early educators. It was endorsed by my professional organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics. When we began, we were focusing most particularly on children who were growing up in poverty. But we've heard over and over again that this is a message that all children need. And when we began, we were talking about being ready for school. Children need language, and they need vocabulary, and they need exposure to written language so they can be ready to school for school. But as we've understood more and more in the last 30 years about brain development, we've begun to see that this is not just about learning some the literacy skills you need in school. It's about emotional development. It's about brain development. It's about all of the tremendously important things that happen in the early years of life. And it's about finding strategies to support parents so that during those early years of life, they can support the brain development of their children. So, this is our program model. It's very, very simple. It's meant for the busy clinic, for the ambulatorio, in which there is never any extra time, and there are always more children waiting outside, and there are always more problems to discuss. At that visit, at that well-child routine visit, you know, if you have, if you've had a baby recently, you come when the baby is one day old, when the baby is two weeks old, one month, two months, four months, six months, nine months, 12 months, as we give the immunizations, this is engraved on my heart, okay? At all of those visits, all of those routine visits, we talk about reading aloud, we talk about how do you read to a newborn baby? How do you read to a six month old? What does it mean? And we talk about routines, reading at bedtime, reading at transition times, and we give, with this advice, a beautiful, new, developmentally, culturally appropriate book. So for the little babies, they're books you can chew. They're board books. Um, but we give a beautiful book at every visit. And then the third piece is in the waiting room. Sometimes we have volunteers who read to the children. Sometimes we have displays, information for the parents, used books they can take home. That's the model. Or to put it another way, here's what I do. Here's what every pediatrician who's trained in this program does, starting at birth and continuing through age five. Talk to the parents about how important it is. Encourage them to cuddle up, to take the baby in their arms, build the routines together, model it, because I have the book in the exam room so I can say, where's the baby? There's the baby. Where's the baby's no There's the nose. And I can do, I can model this. I can demonstrate it in the exam room. I give the book and I use the book in the visit to see what does the child do with the book, to see where the child is developmentally. And here, it's so important, I also put it in Italian, right? That we are modeling, that we're talking, that we're giving the book, and that I'm using the book in the visit to see where the child is developmentally. So for example, and we have developed a curriculum because this is not necessarily part of pediatric training. So here is the developmental guidance for a newborn. And I'm going to show you a training video in a moment. What's important with a newborn? That right from birth, the baby is listening and looking and learning, that you talk and you play and you sing. The baby needs to see your face, face to face, and that your newborn baby already knows your voice and loves your voice. And so, for example, I'm going to show you quickly a f uh, just a little bit of the training video for a newborn baby. So congratulations, first baby. Oh, very good. So what was her birth weight? Um, eight pounds and six Awesome, you're nice and chunky from the beginning. We already got that nice double chin there, huh? So awesome. 
So at this age, they're mostly just eating, pooping, and sleeping. Yeah. You realize that, right? She's on day four, day five, and so you're just going to follow her rhythm. She's the boss now. And you see that she's just nice and calm. She loves to hear your voice and your heartbeat. She's used to that from the nine months she was in the womb. So you want to be talking to her as much as you can. You know, when she's awake, talking, singing, even reading to her, she really loves to hear your voice, and that's going to soothe her. Yeah, so it's really just hearing your voice regardless of what she's doing. Can I listen to you? Yeah. Let's listen from this angle. I know it's chilly. It's chilly. And you don't have to spend a lot of time, you know, it's really just a couple minutes that you're doing. Oh, okay. I know. Mashing on your belly too much. And so even So Again, for the newborn, it's about the back and forth, the talking, the talking to the baby. And what we want to do, and I'm going to show you why, if you show these videos to medical students or to people who are training, you see the difference that was a newborn. I'm going to show you a six-month-old in a moment. And that by bringing these books into the exam room again and again, we can actually give children a basis for success. As you heard, the program has grown a great deal. We are now serving more than four million children in the United States. We're giving out seven million books with this advice at more than 6,000 sites. Most of the children we serve, because of where we direct our energy, most of them are children who are growing up in poverty. It is a program which has been reproduced in other countries. I've worked with the Pediatric Society, for example, in the Philippines to adapt it to their health system. And after my talk, you're going to hear more about Nati Perleggere and how it has been adapted in Italy and now in Switzerland. Um, and all of these, uh, these are materials I took from their very, very wonderful website um, with initiatives for children growing up with different languages in the home and also with much more work in Italy and in Europe with librarians and with other um, specialists who work with young children. Um, much, a much better job for it really than we've done. Um, so this is the image I'm going to show you again and again, is a mother, a child, a pediatrician, and a book. And the message that is supposed to come over and over, the most important message, right? This is not about teaching your baby to read early. It's not, we're not saying, go practice vocabulary. It will make a difference later on in school. What we're trying to say over and over, starting at the very first newborn visit, is that your baby will love books because your baby loves you, your voice, your connection, your relationship. Um, and the further messages that from the time your baby is very young, the reading will help your baby enjoy time with you, help you establish routines, and that those relationships and routines will help your child handle challenges and stress and also build the skills that will help your child learn in school. But again and again, the message is supposed to be your baby will love books because your baby loves you, your baby loves being with you, loves hearing your voice. When I talk to pediatricians, what I say is a little bit different in language. I talk about that supporting positive parent-child interactions helps you promote healthy development, helps you build routines, helps you help parents build routines with language-rich, responsive interactions, and build the relationships which can buffer toxic stress for young children even in difficult times. This is a strength-based approach. You are building on the strength of the parents and the caregivers. You're building on the strength of the relationship between the child and the parent. Books do so much. Books are a remarkable technology for working with young children. They help create lap time. They help create time without screens. They help create daily routines. They give parents a sense of self-efficacy and, and power. And again, 
They help children develop all of the skills that they need to express their needs and their emotions and also to develop the language skills which predict school success. So I'm not going to go through all of the research findings about Reach Out and Read. We have now a good body of peer-reviewed research to show that if parents participate in the program, they're more than twice as likely to read to their children, more than twice as likely to read frequently, more than three days a week, more than twice as likely to say that they enjoy reading together. You, you don't ask them, do you enjoy reading together? You, you ask them, what are your favorite things to do with your baby? And you wait to see if they, they mention reading. Um, and also, when you test the children, the language skills of the children improve. Um, the, I'll show you this study. These are, this is how often parents read aloud more than three days a week. Um, or three or more days a week. And you see that the parents in the intervention group getting the reach out and read model, 66% um, of them are reading aloud three or more days a week, where the parents in the control group just getting standard care with no intervention, only 24% were reading aloud three or more days a week. And this is the language study. This is a study done in New York City. And you see that the children getting the intervention this is in the preschool years when they're maybe three or four years old, they're six months ahead in their receptive language, the words that they recognize, and three months ahead in their expressive language, the words that they say. So for children this age, six months, three months, is a difference that really matters. It may make the difference when they start school, whether they're on the level that you expect for them to start actually learning to read. So the program was endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2014, um, recommend saying that pediatric providers should provide early literacy development advice as an important evidence-based intervention. They wanted us to continue to begin at birth and to continue at least until school entry. And this involved reviewing all the literature and everything I just told you. That participation in the reach out and read intervention is associated with more positive attitudes toward reading aloud, more frequent reading aloud by parents, improved parent-child interactions, improvements in the home literacy environment, and the increases in expressive and receptive language in early childhood. And they advised the American Academy that we should advise all parents about developmentally appropriate strategies with books, that we should give the books at well visits, that we should supplement them with parent information, and that we should work in advocacy to try to get this built into policy across the nation. We have studies to show that the intervention is also good for the providers. It reinforces some of the joy in practicing pediatrics. It's something people look forward to doing. We have studies to show that parents are more likely to come to their appointments, so the children are more likely to have their immunizations on schedule. It's a good way to build a relationship, not only between the parent and the child, but between the parent and the clinic. Um, and we have also started to look at the different strategies that clinicians, pediatricians, can use modeling, giving advice, what seems to work best. So I'm going to show, I showed you a newborn, right? One of the miracles of, uh, the everyday miracles of working in pediatrics is how much babies change. That was a newborn, here's a six month old, same doctor. Hi. Hey you, what's going on? How are you? Yes. So he's smiling now, cheesing. Hey, so you see how he reacts to my voice? He's responding to my voice. So they love to do a little table tennis. I talk, he talks, I talk. I'm sure he's babbling with you yes, now. Always. Are you screaming and yelling? <laughs> and they love the 4 a.m. chatter. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. You just up and playing. Okay. You just up and playing. 
So it's really important at this age that we're just talking and engaging with them as much as possible. Right. Lots of conversation is really going to be the best way for them to develop. So it's not only, yeah, mm -hmm. what, tell me. He has a lot to tell. I see, <laughs> and you know daddy's voice, so you see mm -hmm. how he turns to you? Yeah. So he's been there hearing that voice since he's been in mommy's belly. Mm -hmm. And one day, before you know it, he'll be answering mm -hmm. back, yeah? <laughs> he answers back now. Oh, you do? <laughs> he's not talking to right now. Uh-huh, and do you guys sing mm -hmm. with him as well? Sing, read at night. Ooh, you like to read? Mm -hmm. That's good. I have a brand new book for you here, man. Mm -hmm. Cody, check it out. <gasps> wow. Mm -hmm. So we love the colors. Look at him mm -hmm. reaching for it. Excellent. All so at right, this age, they really go. love to touch. Gotta mm -hmm. go right in the mouth. Yep. So it's all about touching and feeling. You see him responding to the colors. Hey. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's not only hands and feet that go in the mouth, it's everything else <laughs> as well. Look at that. Like that. <gasps> and we love to look at baby faces. Is that you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's she doing? Uh, is she taking a bath? Yes. Yeah, so you can name common items that are around the house, but you can also make up stories. So it's and so this is the kind of advice. It's to, you don't have to sit down and read the whole story from beginning to end. You point at the pictures, you ask questions, you teach the names, you go back and forth as much as you can. One year old. Oh my goodness, you see what I have for you, don't you? I have this book. Do you see this? <gasps> oh dear. What book? Oh, yes. Yes. oh my goodness. You know exactly what that is, Mom. What is this? Is this a moon? Oh, yes. Mom, I am yes. guessing by his reaction that this is not the first time he has seen this book. Um, you guys do some reading together? Yes. This is actually the first time he's seen this book. So again, we use this also to teach medical students and to teach residents. Look what the one-year-old can do. He has a pincer grasp. He can turn pages. He can point with one finger. He can name some of the things he starts to see. It's everything that you can see in the exam room with the book. If I come into the room, if there's the one-year-old, and I give him the book, and he takes it, and he turns it right side up, and he opens it, and he points to something, and he names it, that's a lot of my developmental information that I need. And part of my job is to try to help residents and doctors in training understand how much you can see with the book in the exam room. And we take them through the different guidance that you give for two-year-olds. You ask your child to name things in the illustration. You let the child fill in the sentence. You read the sentence and you say, and the baby said good. And you wait for the child to say, good night, right? You let the child finish the sentence. You choose books with rhymes. You count books with counting. You read the same book over and over to two-year-olds. Where's the dog? What does the dog say? Um, and then we move on, right, for every age. So for the four-year-old, you're asking the child to tell you the story. You're pointing out the letters in his name. You're connecting it to her own experiences. and. The four-year-old is already recognizing numbers and letters, is already starting to retell stories to you, and can follow much longer, more complicated stories. And I will just point out to you that when we talk about page-turning skills, this was also of interest to Renaissance painters. And you can find Renaissance paintings of Madonna and child in which the painter is actually interested in how does a small child handle a book. So I have to very quickly mention some of the things. We've been around for 35, 30, almost 35 years. Some of the things we're especially interested in trying to look at now to do a better job. We're interested in book diversity, books that reflect the diversity of the population we work with. We have 26 languages of bilingual books. We're looking for books in which children can see themselves and their families and their community. Um, and there are more and more books available that will help us do that. We're looking for ways to choose good books that are also diverse and inclusive. 
And there's a famous quote that books can be windows, books can be mirrors, and books can also be sliding glass doors for children. And it's our responsibility in choosing books to find books which can be all of those things for the families we work with. We've been interested in the question of how you can use books to also support early math skills. Because it turns out that for many families, counting things on the page, asking questions about size and number is an easy, accessible way to talk about the books with their children, and it's fun. So we've tr we don't have special books for math. We look at ways to use the regular books that you can also talk about the relative sizes, the relative numbers. We've looked at for ways to use books with children who have different kinds of developmental disabilities, looked for ways to support families who have other medical issues going on with their children. And finally, we've looked at the whole question of, as we've understood more and more about how books can stimulate neurodevelopment, what is our next chapter? What comes next for us? And what we really want to do is, you, through Reach Out and Read, we want to use pediatric primary care to support the positive interactions between parents and children that foster healthy brain development during these critical early years. We have a way here to use the primary care visit, to use the books to support the parents in helping their children, helping the brain develop in a good and positive way. And this means that we are trying hard to look at both the relationship with the clinic visit, the relationship between the family and the clinic, the relationship between the parent and the child. We're trying to build on all of those relationships all around the book and the child who's chewing on the book. What I'm talking about here especially is, look, we think about this as an iceberg. The part of the iceberg that we can see above the water is everything that we started out with, school readiness, early literacy skills, vocabulary, language. But what's under the water supporting all of that is the relationship. It's the child's sense of security. It's the interaction, the back and forth with the parent or with the caregiver. It's the stimulation from the environment. It's the social and emotional development. And if those relationships don't develop, you won't support the vocabulary. You won't support the school readiness. You won't support those pieces that you can see above the water. Um, we want to talk about positive childhood experiences because we know now that the early experiences change the way that a child's brain forms and functions, that it affects the child's resilience and the ability to withstand toxic stress, that it can even change the way the child's genes turn off and on, and that this is it's cognitive development, but it's also social emotional development, and that this will affect the child's health and well-being in childhood but across the entire lifespan. I'll mention briefly the question of toxic stress. We talk about three, three levels of stress, the positive stress. That's me knowing that I'm supposed to finish my lecture in 40 minutes, OK? If you measure my pulse rate or you measure my stress hormones, there's a little stress, but it's good, because otherwise I might talk too long. Um, so that's positive stress. Then there's tolerable stress. That's the stress of the bad things that happen. But if a child has loving family relationships, they can survive, they can manage. And then there's the possibility of toxic stress, which is the intense, prolonged activation of a stress response, especially if there are no positive relationships to help the child survive. And what we're talking about is the difference between the difficulties which children can survive with loving care and help and the difficulties which can crush them. We talk a lot about adverse childhood experiences, that is to say the bad things that can happen in a child's life. And they can include anything from abuse, neglect, to 
any of the harsh things that can happen early, and it's been suggested, it's been studied to say that more such adverse experiences in early childhood can be directly related to many mental health and health difficulties later in life. And there are, um, there, there are at this point a lot of studies on adverse childhood experiences and both health and mental health outcomes ranging from alcoholism and substance abuse and mental health problems to heart disease, stroke, and cancer. But what we want to talk about more and need to talk about more is positive childhood experiences and the way that positive childhood experiences can mitigate the effects of adverse childhood experiences so that the likelihood, for example, of depression in adulthood is affected not only by how many bad things happened to you, how many adverse experiences you had, but also by the kind of positive childhood experiences that you had. And in fact, positive childhood experiences can overcome the effects of the adverse childhood experiences, and children can flourish and grow with the support of their families and their family relationships. So the most recent policy statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics is actually about preventing childhood toxic stress by focusing on the safe, stable, nurturing relationships that buffer adversity and build resilience. And we think of this as a paradigm shift, as a way that we could change the priorities of our clinical activities, rewrite research agendas, and realign our collective advocacy. And what I'm talking to you about with encouraging parents reading to children is part of that realignment and that paradigm shift. Um, this was the recommendation for what families should get, and you'll see that Reach Out and Read is suggested as a universal primary prevention strategy for all children. It's not a, sim a simple answer or a simple problem. It's not enough, but it's necessary for all children. And really, what I'm talking about here is defining the trajectory of a child's life so that if you are balancing adverse childhood experiences with positive childhood experiences, we can push children over toward the side of positive effects and positive experiences. Because when we build the reading routines into the day, we're building in small, reassuring, language-rich, affectionate, positive childhood experiences. Reading aloud as a parenting activity is one of the positive parenting activities. It's not the only one, but it's an important one. It's rich in language, and we, if, ch if children build it into their routines, so for example, if you have a child who won't go to sleep at night without hearing a book, that child will hear a book every night because the parents will want the child to go to bed. Um, and activities like reading aloud together result in a 33% reduction in the probability of social emotional deficits and the risk of developmental delay. These positive experiences really, really matter. And so what we hope is that Reach Out and Read can be at the center of an approach in pediatric primary care which can create these positive childhood experiences and help define the trajectory of a young child's life. Here. One more Rafael Madonna here again. Look at the gaze. Look how interested the painter is in where is the child looking and where is the mother looking focused around the book. So I would finish by saying to you that learning to read is a very difficult thing. Children have better brains than I have, and it's still a difficult thing. You have to integrate your visual pathways, your cognitive skills, your memory, your phonological awareness, your phonemic awareness as you're trying to decode those letters, your vocabulary, your sense of sequence, your sense of story, and all of it comes very much affected by your motivation. Reading aloud to children is a triumph of the spirit. It's a way to support and nurture their brains during these vital developmental windows, to maintain the routines that create security, 
to teach children words and numbers and concepts and rhymes and stories, but all in the context of attention and affection. And so children are learning also at the same time that books are sources of pleasure and information, and that their parents who open these books with them can actually help open up the world for them. When we talk about books building better brains, it's those interactions so rich in language, the serve and return, the face time, the lap time, the routines, the parents feeling less stressed, the exposure to print, the positive associations, the school and preschool readiness. So there's a lot of ways to talk about this. We're talking about responsive parenting, empowering parents, helping create a more stimulating environment with supportive relationships and routines. We hope for more community engagement at the library. We hope for school readiness. We hope they'll like going to the doctor if there are more books. But I started with that sentence, your child will love books because your child loves you. Um, tuo bambino amara i libri perché ama boy, okay? But I would actually say there's a more important way to build on that. You and your child will, in, you will love looking at books together, and looking at books together will actually build your love. So it will happen for both of you together. And I'll finish with Botticelli's Madonna. Professor Klaas, thank you very much for your outstanding lecture, fantastic lecture. And we, we have learned many, many important things about uh, this uh, not well-known topic, I would say, also, also in my country. But uh, I'm, very, I'm very happy that you, you also <laughs> employed less time that <laughs> for see, perfect. Now is the time for the reading intermezzo. I will shift from English to Italian because it's simple for me to, to explain this. <laughs> Dunque, sapete che quest'anno abbiamo questa pausa, pausa per modo di dire, letteraria, che è un progetto eh, creato da Carmelo Rifici, che è il direttore artistico del LAC, con un team molto qualificato di collaboratori, tra cui Riccardo Favaro per la parte drammaturgica. E stasera abbiamo il piacere di avere con noi l'attrice Mariangela Granelli, che <ride> ci leggerà un testo tratto dall'opera Contro la morte di Elias Canetti, che credo conosciate come uno dei grandi scrittori del secolo scorso, premio Nobel per la letteratura nel 1981, che in pratica visse sempre portando con sé questo, questo libro mai, mai pubblicato, una raccolta di più di 50 anni di una serie di appunti eh, aneddoti, meditazioni, è indefinibile in pratica come tipo, tipologia di, di opera. E prendeva ogni giorno appunti su quello che era questo chio, suo chiodo fisso, la lotta contro la morte, contro la violenza del potere. E il libro fu pubblicato postumo vent'anni dopo la sua morte da un editore tedesco nel, nel 2014. Oltre a questi... Eh, spezzoni di, di, questa, di questa opera, avremo anche dei, dei, dei frammenti da Louis Borges, Robert Walser e Hans Sanner, quindi un mix veramente inquietante. Riuscirò a farlo, sì, riuscirò. 
riuscirò a scrivere un libro sulla morte ne sono sempre più persuaso ma ci riuscirò solo avendo l'assoluta certezza che non sarò io a darlo alle stampe nel tempo da vivere che ancora mi resta bisogna che questo libro ci sia o perlomeno che ce ne sia una parte abbastanza consistente così da poter essere in seguito pubblicato solo in questo modo posso essere davvero sicuro che mi pronuncerò sempre con sincerità senza riguardo per i vivi senza riguardo soprattutto per la malattia di mia moglie e non vorrei esserci quando verrà pubblicato anche per non dover lottare in sua difesa voglio dire quello che penso voglio dirlo senza riguardi ma non voglio lottare forse basterebbe disporre in ordine cronologico tutti i miei appunti sulla morte non ancora pubblicati ma questo tipo di progetto non mi soddisfa perché finora ho sempre accarezzato l'idea di utilizzare i pensieri su questo tema per un libro che avrei ancora pubblicato io ma credo di poter dire le cose ultime e veramente importanti solo sapendo che non ci sarò più quando verranno recepite questa ricezione implica qualcosa di indegno e l'idea mi è intollerabile non si tratta di me si tratta della morte finché colui che parla della morte è vivo le cose che dice gli appartengono e su questo precisamente su questo non è lecito contrattare ma le cose che dice durano poco tempo in mano sua ciò che è duraturo ha sempre qualcosa di tranquillizzante perfino quando è motivo di massima inquietudine lo stabilizzarsi di una malattia ci ottunde i sensi ci abituiamo alla malattia e la sua stabilizzazione fa sembrare meno grave il pericolo lo stesso effetto dilagò per la pace europea dal 1945 dopo questo lungo periodo dicevano è impossibile che scoppi una guerra continuiamo tranquillamente ad armarci dunque continuiamo a cavalcare sul nostro cavallo morto eppure eppure scriveva Walser lei sta dunque per morire e guai se qualcuno mi dirà che i campi di battaglia e altri orrori sono più orrendi e più orribili della fine di una qualsiasi persona la fine è crudele di per sé e ogni vita umana è una vita eroica e morire è sempre e in qualsiasi circostanza ugualmente desolante crudele e triste e ogni persona deve aspettarsi la cosa peggiore la cosa più penosa e ogni stanza in cui giace un morto è una stanza tragica e a nessuna vita umana è mai mancato il carattere sublime della tragedia ogni vita umana ogni vita ogni processo vitale possiede il carattere sublime della tragedia e della rigenerazione del ritorno nel corso dell'intero processo vitale alcune cellule muoiono e ne nascono di nuove magari a differenza di questo progressivo estinguersi la morte consisterebbe solo nel fatto che tutte le cellule si sono estinte però anche al sopraggiungere della morte totale alcune cellule continuano a vivere ai cadaveri in putrefazione crescono ancora i capelli e le unghie persino la produzione di spermatozoi continua oltre la morte in teoria sarebbe possibile generare un nuovo essere vivente con gli spermatozoi di un morto la biologia da sola non può dunque offrirci altro che un'idea imprecisa della morte ma 
Ma dov'è il confine tra la vita e la morte in questo processo? Non lo sappiamo. La biologia sa definire la morte altrettanto poco di quanto sa definire la vita e le peculiarità dell'essere umano. E la disposizione d'animo che tu, nel complesso, hai per la vita, per qualsiasi vita, su cosa poggia? Se servisse solo a nascondere il fatto che tu non vuoi morire, non avrebbe alcun valore. Ma anche se fosse sincera e includesse davvero tutto, in che modo potrebbero tutti meritare di vivere? La sofferenza continua che sta alla radice di questa vita l'hai conosciuta meglio di chiunque altro. E ciò nonostante bisogna vivere? È un interrogativo a cui non so rispondere. Sono, è evidente, uno sciovinista di tutti gli uomini, di tutti gli animali, forse anche di tutte le piante, un indù senza trasmigrazione delle anime, un cristiano senza Dio. Mi vedo davanti, senza alcun timore, masse che crescono a dismisura e ogni tentativo di limitarne la crescita servendosi della morte suscita in me odio e disgusto. Non ho mai accettato, non ho mai ammesso la morte, fosse pur stata quella dell'uomo più vecchio e più misero. L'immagine dei soldati egiziani morti nel deserto del Sinai mi perseguita come la rampa di Auschwitz. So che cosa quegli stessi soldati avrebbero fatto se fossero arrivati nelle città degli ebrei. Ma adesso i morti sono loro. Adesso porto io il loro rancore. Non sono capace di fare differenza tra i morti. Non è il mio potere. Non posso ledere questo fondamentale convincimento. Come convincimento universale si rivelerebbe utile, credo. E se venisse accolto potrebbe svanire tante difficoltà connaturate alla convivenza umana. In fondo non riesco a pensare a nient'altro. Io qui sto prendendo le parti di qualcosa che è altrettanto importante quanto in apparenza circoscritto. La speranza. Continuo ad averla ma non è più la stessa speranza. La morte mi ha colpito troppo duramente e l'amore mi ha dato una felicità troppo intensa. La speranza. La speranza termina con la sventura del mondo. Il mondo se l'è tirata addosso da sé e io io continuo a disperarmi e ad essere attaccato al mondo e non so darmi pace per il suo destino. Così scrivo. Scrivo per, per tutte le vite mancate. Per tutte le vite mancate. Tutte le vite mancate. Tutti quelli che non furono mai amati tutti quelli che non seppero amare, tutti quelli cui non fu dato di accudire un bambino, tutti quelli che non erano a casa loro, tutti quelli che non conobbero la varietà degli animali, tutti quelli che non prestarono mai ascolto a lingue straniere, tutti quelli che mai si stupirono per le diverse forme di credulità, tutti quelli che non si batterono mai contro la morte, tutti quelli che non furono sopraffatti dal bisogno di sapere, tutti quelli cui non fu concesso di dimenticare le loro innumerevoli conoscenze, tutti quelli che non vacillarono mai, tutti quelli che non dissero mai di no, tutti quelli che non si vergognarono mai della loro pancia, tutti quelli che non sognarono la fine delle uccisioni, tutti quelli che non cedettero mai al loro orgoglio, tutti quelli che non seppero farsi piccoli che non riuscirono a scomparire, tutti quelli che non seppero mentire senza che questo servisse a qualcosa, tutti quelli che non tremarono davanti al lampo della verità, 
tutti quelli che non provarono un ardente desiderio degli dei scomparsi, tutti quelli che non fecero amicizia con coloro della cui lingua non capivano neppure una parola, tutti quelli che non liberarono gli schiavi, tutti quelli che non affogarono nella compassione, tutti quelli che si vergognavano di non aver ucciso un uomo, tutti quelli che non si lasciarono depredare per gratitudine, tutti quelli che non si rifiutarono di abbandonare la terra, tutti quelli che non seppero mai dimenticare che cos'è un nemico, tutti quelli che non si spogliarono mai dei loro averi, tutti quelli che non si lasciarono mai ingannare e tutti quelli che dimenticarono quanto fossero stati ingannati, tutti quelli che non tagliarono la testa alla loro supponenza, tutti quelli che per saggezza non sorrisero, tutti quelli che per magnanimità non risero. Per tutte tutte le vite mancate perché tu mio caro lettore proprio tu sai bene che se io potessi vivere se io potessi vivere un'altra volta la mia vita nella prossima cercherei di fare più errori non cercherei di essere tanto perfetto, mi negherei di più, sarei meno servio di quanto sono stato, di fatti prenderei pochissime cose sul serio, sarei meno igienico, correrei più rischi, farei più viaggi, guarderei più tramonti, salirei più montagne, nuoterei più fiumi, andrei in posti dove non sono mai andato, mangerei più gelati e meno fave, avrei più problemi reali, e meno immaginari io sono stato una di quelle persone che ha vissuto sensatamente e precisamente ogni minuto della sua vita certo che ho avuto momenti di gioia ma se potessi tornare indietro cercherei di avere soltanto buoni momenti nel caso non lo sappiate di quello è fatta la vita solo di momenti non ti perdere l'oggi. Io ero uno di quelli che non andava mai in nessun posto senza un termometro, una borsa dell'acqua calda, un ombrello e un paracadute. Se potessi vivere di nuovo comincerei ad andare scalzo all'inizio della primavera e continuerei così fino alla fine dell'autunno. Farei più giri nella carrozzella, guarderei più albe, giocherei di più con i bambini se avessi un'altra volta la vita davanti ma guarda sono vecchio ormai e so che sto morendo dunque perché ti neghi al pensiero di un'altra vita precedente, futura perché ti fa orrore persino la parola trasmigrazione delle anime sei schiavo di questo unico, solido tavolo al quale ora scrivi? Di ciò che ti è prossimo? Di ciò che ti circonda? Non puoi sacrificare nessuno, nulla per un'altra vita? Non ti attraggono riconoscimenti e incontri inattesi? Per te, proprio per te, i tuoi morti sono interamente morti? Perché... È bene che tu lo sappia, ci sono certe cose che possono venire solo dai morti. Non si lascia nulla in eredità. Mi è capitato di pensarlo continuamente. Si lasciano frasi che vengono annotate in modo sbagliato e intese in modo ancora più sbagliato. Ma se fosse davvero tutto inutile, se 88 anni non fossero serviti a nulla, se ogni ora, di ogni giorno, di ogni mese, di ogni anno si disfacesse nel nulla, perché mai continui ad annotare instancabilmente quel che ti assilla? Queste tue frasi non sono forse vergate per essere poi lette da qualcuno che grazie ad esse torni in sé, le prenda in mano, le soppesi, le ponderi e mentre riflette si imponga una sosta? 
Non penso solo a te, caro lettore. Non solo a te, penso a tutti, a ogni possibilità, dunque a tutti e a nessuno. Penso agli altri, senza sosta. È una speranza, o forse un nascondiglio, un dubbio, un riparo, o forse un inganno. Se uno vive con l'idea di non esistere, non deve certo dirlo ad anima viva. Se proprio gli altri lo venissero a sapere, lui sparirebbe del tutto. Se riesce invece a conservare il segreto, può invecchiare senza che nessuno si accorga di nulla. Dio! Solo la parola per me non è mai del tutto morta. Continuo a usarla, nei momenti più impensati, mai con abbandono, mai con fede, affrancato da ogni senso di gratitudine, no, in collera, con quella collera che mi fa dopo tutto esistere. Così potrebbe sentirsi una vespa che va a sbattere 700 volte contro il vetro di una finestra e poi da me chi è mai costui viene rimessa in libertà grazie grazie, Bene, grazie speciale a Mariangela Granelli per questa lettura che credo ci abbia toccato nel profondo stavo pensando che questi intermezzi letterali dovrebbero essere resi obbligatori nelle scuole ritorniamo al programma più orientato verso la scienza, la medicina Continua in italiano perché poi il prossimo relatore parlerà in italiano. E il programma Reach Out and Read è, arrivò in Europa una ventina di anni fa, dieci anni dopo essere stato diffuso negli Stati Uniti. E una delle prime nazioni eh, che lo eh, adottò fu la Svizzera, grazie proprio a un'iniziativa che partì dal Ticino. E qui con noi abbiamo Orazio Dotta, che è testimone di questa avventura, è direttore della sede di Bibliomedia in Canton Ticino, e ci racconterà appunto questa, questo, questa bella, bella esperienza che così completa un po' il discorso del, che ci ha fatto la professoressa Class. Prego. Buonasera a tutti, eh, grazie, grazie per l'invito ehm, a partecipare questa sera. Il mio intervento sarà molto breve, semplicemente per testimoniare l'esistenza del progetto Nati per leggere anche in Svizzera, e in particolare nella Svizzera italiana dove appunto è stato detto eh, è partito. Um, noi abbiamo voluto uh, fortemente questo, questo progetto nel 2006, ci siamo attivati per uh, introdurlo, non esisteva e, um, e non avendo uh, così esperienze in, in merito ci siamo, uh, ci siamo indirizzati uh, verso il progetto uh, italiano Nati per leggere Italia che era già attivo da, da qualche anno e soprattutto ci siamo appoggiati anche uh, con uh, il coinvolgimento dell'associazione culturale dei pediatri italiani. Abbiamo fatto arrivare in Ticino eh, questi per personaggi eh, con questa esperienza per incontrare bibliotecari, per incontrare pediatri, per incontrare eh, famiglie, per incontrare insomma insegnanti, tutte quelle persone alle quali il progetto sarebbe poi, eh, alle quali il progetto avremmo chiesto di, eh, come dire, di, di, collaborare, eh, di collaborare con noi. 
Gli scopi del progetto eh, che, eh, che si muove sulla fa, su, sulla, diciamo così, sul, sugli intenti di Reach Out and Read che avete sentito eh, poc'anzi ehm, sono, eh, sto andando dalla parte sbagliata, sono questi, eh, sviluppare la, sensibilizzare la popolazione sull'importanza dello sviluppo del linguaggio nella prima infanzia, quello che è l'emergent literacy, tutto quello che arriva eh, nel bambino prima ancora che arrivi a imparare a leggere e scrivere, incoraggiare i genitori ad usare i libri come, eh, come abitudine quotidiana proprio per un'interazione, per creare relazione con, con i bambini piccoli sin, sin dai primi mesi di vita e poi raggiungere sicuramente tutte le famiglie, le famiglie eh, sia quelle che eh, socialmente svantaggiate, le famiglie stranieri, ma in generale eh, tutte le famiglie in cui, eh, in cui si registra una, una nuova nascita. Ehm, e poi ancora, eh, qui vedete i vari scopi del progetto, un altro molto importante è quello di promuovere la consapevolezza che il libro e la lettura sono importanti strumenti per i genitori che vogliono accompagnare i loro bambini nella crescita degli affetti e delle emozioni. Quindi ha un po' due anime questo progetto, la parte cognitiva ma anche la parte delle emozioni e della costruzione della persona in generale. Eh, nel, eh, nel 2008 il progetto è anche diventato un progetto nazionale, di questo siamo molto orgogliosi e fieri perché è partito appunto dal Ticino, è diventato un progetto nazionale, quest'anno festeggia i 15 anni e grazie a questo abbiamo avuto anche dei fondi eh, maggiori e abbiamo potuto creare un pacchetto regalo. Un pacchetto regalo che va a tutte le famiglie in Svizzera, o almeno questo è l'auspicio nostro, ehm, per, assieme ad un opuscolo informativo eh, in, in più lingue, proprio per spiegare alle famiglie la fina, le finalità di questo, di questo progetto. Durante eh, questi 15 anni abbiamo creato un sito internet che potreste anche visitare, natiperleggere.ch, abbiamo organizzato nella Svizzera italiana una sessantina di eventi formativi e informativi destinati sia agli operatori del settore che alle famiglie con una media di 4 eventi all'anno. Eh, ogni mese proponiamo una, eh, una, una bibliografia di libri che escono, ehm, escono eh, nelle librerie cioè, eh, destinati proprio alla fascia 0-5 anni, quindi nell'arco di, di un anno pro, 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 eh, proponiamo un centinaio di volumi, questo per un po' per aiutare gli operatori ma anche le famiglie a scegliere i libri interessanti per questa fascia d'età. Abbiamo realizzato un sondaggio sull'impatto del, del programma in Ticino, abbiamo visto che dalla nascita di questo programma ehm, ci, sono, ci sono ad esempio nelle, nelle biblioteche molta più frequenza delle famiglie con bambini piccoli, creato una rete di collaborazioni sul territorio importante per far arrivare eh, questo progetto e prodotto a livello nazionale e distribuito 431.000 pacchetti nati per leggere. I pacchetti nati per leggere sono, eh, lo, lo vedete eh, nel nella slide è un piccolo box che contiene due libri cartonati per la, proprio per la prima infanzia e un pieghevole informativo in 17 lingue dove, che è indirizzato ai genitori e spiega ehm, i vari passi eh, dell'evoluzione del bambino tra i 0 e i 5 anni nelle capacità dell'approccio alla lettura e all'oggetto libro. Eh, nella Svizzera italiana, solo nella Svizzera italiana, usiamo anche un opuscolo informativo dal eh, titolo Cre Nati per leggere Crescere con i libri, perché noi distribuiamo il pacchetto ma vorremmo anche eh, far arrivare un po' di informazioni alle famiglie e attraverso questo opuscolo andiamo a sopperire la mancanza della mediazione del, diciamo così, del, um, della persona che possa spiegare il progetto. Noi vorremmo moltissimo avere la collaborazione dei pediatri eh, che, ehm, che possa fare appunto da trade union tra questo progetto e le famiglie. La distribuzione, ehm, eh, con la distribuzione in, in, in tutti questi anni siamo arrivati a, arriva a raggiungere il 43% delle famiglie in Svizzera e il 54% delle famiglie eh, in Ticino, quindi un buon risultato ma non è ancora il risultato che noi vorremmo raggiungere perché eh, naturalmente vorremmo arrivare a, dei, a delle cifre molto più alte di queste. 
Abbiamo creato in tutti questi anni una rete di collaborazioni, Nel, nella Svizzera italiana il pacchetto Natili per leggere e le informazioni vengono ehm, così divulgate anche grazie ai, alla, alla collaborazione con i comuni, abbiamo quasi tutti i comuni che collaborano con, con, questo, con questo progetto e con la collaborazione delle biblioteche, soprattutto le biblioteche per ragazzi. Nel resto della Svizzera abbiamo anche, eh, abbiamo anche pediatri, consulenti familiari, eh, rappresentanti del settore sociale, e, e, molte, e tutte quelle persone che lavorano con, nel settore della, della prima infanzia. Eh, costi, criticità e avvenire del progetto, i costi annuali di questo progetto è di 380 franchi che sono a carico della nostra piccola fondazione che non ha grandissime entrate ed è un progetto quindi che è a rischio perché dopo 15 anni ehm, portare avanti dei costi di questo tipo è davvero complicato e difficile. Stiamo cercando dei finanziamenti anche nel privato ma eh, ci accorgiamo che l'economia privata non investe molto in progetti a lunga, dur a lunga durata e quindi stiamo facendo delle, delle difficoltà. Anche per questo è in corso uno studio per verificare l'impatto del progetto a livello nazionale e lo stiamo facendo con la collaborazione dell'Alta Scuola Pedagogica di San Gallo e l'Università di Ginevra, avremo dei risultati nella primavera del 2024 e speriamo che questi risultati ci possano anche eh, aiutare ad andare verso terzi poi per cercare anche dei finanziamenti per sostenere questo progetto. Nella Svizzera italiana, appunto come dicevo prima, eh, ci piacerebbe estendere questo progetto anche alla collaborazione dei pediatri che hanno il contatto diretto con le famiglie e come avete visto da la relazione precedente, l'importanza del, del loro ruolo in, in, questo, in questo settore. Eh, concludo, concludo con le parole di un pediatra che è Andreas Wexler, è un pediatra attivo eh, nel, nel Luganese, lui ha, ehm, ha tenuto dei corsi per noi eh, destinati eh, alle, alle famiglie, ha ehm, un articolo all'interno di questo opuscolo informativo che mettiamo a disposizione delle famiglie, lui parla dello sviluppo del linguaggio, dello sviluppo personale e sociale, sviluppo cognitivo, motorio, dello sviluppo musicale e conclude dicendo queste, queste parole. Nati per leggere è dunque un'iniziativa che invita a sostenere lo sviluppo dei nostri pargoli toccando tutti i canali dello sviluppo contemporaneamente nella pienezza di un'esperienza emotiva. È proprio una bella idea. Parola di pediatra. <ride> Io mi fermo qui, eh, vi ringrazio per l'attenzione e lascio, vi lascio uh, alla, alla continuazione di questa serata. Grazie mille. Questo intervento fosse proprio appropriato come testimonianza di quello che si sta facendo e cerchiamo di dare una mano a Nati per leggere CH, insomma, perché mi sembra un'iniziativa molto lodevole che ha bisogno di un sostegno abbastanza esteso. Now I shift in English because uh, we have the second special guest, Professor Oscar Ienni. Uh, professor Ienni we talk about reading to children as a stimulus for a happy and long life, a brief presentation. Um, Professor Yenni is, uh, teaches uh, developmental pediatrics at the University of Zurich and conducts research in pediatrics and uh, developmental psychology as well in neuropsychology. He is the principal investigator of the Zurich Longitudinal Studies, which is a special uh, initiative um, that started uh, in the 50s already with uh, a court, uh, court enrolled of f f 400 or 500, but she would explain better than me. Then another co a second court was um, followed since the uh, 70s. And uh, in the 30 year period before 2000, the, ch the children of the first court were uh, followed up, well, were uh, studied again to see how was their development in adults' life. And now they are tracking uh, all the results of the three scores in, in the last three, four years, and uh, they will have 
millions of data to handle and uh, we will see in the future the, 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 the publication of that will emerge. He's involved uh, also in other projects like uh, uh, Swiss Prescluer Health Study and NRP74 study focusing children with developmental disorder. She has, he has published over two 200 papers, articles, and is uh, the author of the book Understanding Child Development, published two years ago by Springer. Professor Yeni, please, the, the stage is yours. Grazie mille, professore Grossi, per uh, l'invito uh, da, da Zurigo qui a Lugano. Uh, mi, uh, fat, uh, mi ha fatto uh, molto piacere. But now I switch to English because I couldn't um, give the talk and the lecture in Italian. My Italian is not as good as, a, as it seems to be. Um, so reading to children um, is something very special. Obviously, we've heard that from Perry Klaas. We've heard that uh, uh, also um, in the previous um, presentation. Researchers um, have investigated over the past 40 years how sharing books together with children uh, may shape their development. Actually, reading to children is a very special technique for scaffolding, to use this term of the uh, very famous Russian uh, developmental psychologist Leif Vygotsky uh, for scaffolding, for shaping children's cognition and um, language. Actually, the scientific evidence for the effects of reading aloud, reading together with children, is overwhelming. I show you here a very complex graph. It's a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is a, a, a summary of all the studies around about reading aloud, uh, reading uh, to children. You see there are 20, 30 uh, um, publications over the past uh, 20 years, all showing that language development is enhanced, optimized in these children. Um, every study which is um, on the right, on the right side, well, this is not working. On the right side of the line, uh, shows a beneficial effect. So most studies show a beneficial effect, and even that uh, red um, diamond uh, shows that the effect is actually quite large. So it is effective. But let me tell you first about myself and my children. These are three of my four children, I think 18, 18 years back. So they're grown up right now. Um, um, and think about this question. What is an everyday moment with your child that you enjoy? And with everyday moment, I don't mean a, a particular beautiful or a very particular a moment, but just a a really everyday moment that happens on a normal day that may shed light onto a gray day. I don't mean a moment where your child enjoys, but rather a moment where you would say, I really like doing this with my child. Well, I can tell you a very personal story about this. Um, it was always late. And my son came to me and said with a rather accusing voice, you're still reading to me, aren't you? Well, the connection of my uh, brain with my heart is sometimes, runs sometimes very winding roads. And uh, I didn't say what I actually thought. Oh, no, it's too late. I. I said what I felt. OK, yes, but only two chapters. Um, and I crawled into his bed. So really reading 
reading connects people in a way that a Netflix series or a TV show can never do. When I usually read aloud, it's very magic. It's, it's somehow a magic situation between me and my sons. It's a mixture between concentration and attention, but also, a mi but also some calming. So very unlike with whatever, an iPad or a laptop, you become a medium of yourself with your voice and you really give something to your child. Well, in any case, you dive into a story when you um, read aloud uh, to your children. You, 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 you dive in from very different sides, from very different backgrounds, from very different experiences during the daytime. But still together, together, side by side. Well. The question is what books work well, actually, any book, because it's not important what you read, it's important that you read, that you're present, that you feel the warm body, that you feel the breathing um, of your child. With that said, it's important, reading is, imp reading, it, it's, with that said, reading is important for cognitive and language development, but reading evokes a very particular feeling. And we call this feeling in German, Geborgenheit. Well, Geborgenheit, well, I, there's no translation, whether in Italian nor in English, maybe in Dutch, maybe there, there is a translation um, in Dutch. Actually, Geborgenheit was selected in 2004 as the most beautiful word of the German language. It's in, in Thai, that feeling of Geborgenheit is called Ubunjai. Actually, Geborgenheit is not Sicurezza, it's not security, it's more, it's warmth, it's acceptance, and there are many uh, additional words coming along with that word Geborgenheit. And it is evoked, and I call this usually in German, when caregivers support and provide the four Vs, vertraut, verfügbar, verlässlich, verhältnismäßig, voller Liebe. So familiar, available, reliable, reasonable, full of love. So does Geborgenheit lead to a happy life. So does reading aloud leads to a happy life? Well, happiness is a complex um, construct. Happiness is a very complex state, which um, can be understood in very several ways. Emotionally be happy, um, then it's characterized by joy, by pleasure, or cognitively happy. Cognitively happy means that you reflect your own life as a whole. You assess your life as largely positive, satisfying. You say you have a high life satisfaction. And actually, that's exactly how is it measured in science. Life satisfaction is measured by this very special scale, the so-called life satisfaction scale, which was developed by Diener in 1985 so many decades ago. And there are five questions you have to answer. In uh, most ways, my life is close to my ideal. The conditions of my life are excellent. I'm satisfied with my life. So far, I have gotten the important things in I want in life. If I could live my life to over, I would change almost nothing. So, many studies have used as an outcome measure, life satisfaction. And obviously, it is the most important outcome measure. It's much more important than income, education, qualification. It's the question how satisfied 
you are with your life. And obviously, many aspects during childhood drive life satisfa satisfaction on the longer term. And I show you here a just recently published uh, paper where these authors have looked at life satisfaction in the British cohort study. So they have asked the individuals between 26, 30, 34, and 42 how satisfied they're with their lives. And they have looked into their childhoods and have looked into which elements are most important for long-term life satisfaction. Interestingly, many aspects during childhood do not fade away. They do not go away. They're quite stable. So most importantly, and that's what you see on this graph, non-cognitive still skills, non-cognitive skills are st more st the strongest predictor of life satisfaction on the long term. So it's not intelligence, the intellectual performance. It's not the family psychosocial background. It's not the family economic background. It's the emotional health. It's the Geborgenheit, actually, that children get. Non-cognitive skills are more important for long-term life satisfaction. So obviously, and that's what um, Professor Grassi has said, we have the, the Zurich Longitudinal Studies. We're just starting to, to, to expand this study to a true lifespan study. We will have a lot of data over the next, let's say, five years because we have two waves now of 65 and 70 year old individuals. And uh, the idea is to get an idea, the idea is to, to uh, um, evaluate, to discover the factors which are the most important factors for a healthy and happy life. Well, we've asked the people at 65, how is your life satisfaction? And you see here the distribution of life satisfaction with this um, instrument at the inner used. You see they're all around 30. There are some who are not as satisfied and others who are very satisfied. So there's quite a nice distribution. I said IQ is not as important. In fact, we correlated here IQ at age five years, in these individuals, you see this on the x-axis, with life satisfaction at age 65. You see there are a couple of individuals up there with a life satisfaction of 35. There are others down, but IQ is not important. So it's not the stimulation, it's not IQ which drives life satisfaction on the long term. It's not whether you are a smart kid or not. It's the non-cognitive skills. Fortunately, we have a very nice collaboration with a partner project, with the Life Stories project. At the same time, in the 50s of the last century, Mari Meyerhofer was a physician in Zurich and she studied in a population-based study all infants in the Zurich institutions. So in the 1950s, um, in Switzerland, placing infants into institution, institutions was quite a norm, especially um, when women had children without being married or uh, uh, infants were placed in institutions from migrant workers, for example, from Gastarbeiter. They were very commonly uh, placed in these institutions. Well, these institutions, the children were perfectly cared in terms of physical care, nutrition, infectious uh, 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 measures against infectious diseases, but they were emotionally deprived. They didn't have as much contact to, uh, to adults as the families 
as the children uh, who, raised, who were raised in families. So we were able to track these individuals back because our Zurich Longitudinal Study was a control group, so-called so a control group, to these deprived individuals. So it, we invited these individuals again 65 years later. Um, and of course, um, these situations there, as you can imagine, they looked like this. But um, how was the life satisfaction at 65? You see green here, the children raised in families, and red, the institutionalized children. You see that these curves, they overlap. There are many individuals who were institutionalized have a good life satisfaction. But still, there are quite a number of individuals with poor life satisfaction 65 years later. So there is an effect of early emotional deprivation which remains very, very long. Which not only remains long, which also kills. This is the survival curve of the children in, in institutionalized settings and raised by families. You see the risk of dying is 1.5 higher in the institutionalized children compared to the children raised in families. We have, we're just writing this up. We hope that we're gonna have the first publications in the beginning of next year. But we can today say that infants with suboptimal, with adverse, adverse early um, conditions where nobody read to them, where nobody really cared for them emotionally, that they show 60 years later poorer physical mental health, poorer life satisfaction, less coupled relationships, poor cognitive skills, less emotional regulation. In all the variables, we found poorer performances. So caring for the children emotionally and reading is one very important way of how you care for your child from the emotional point is highly beneficial on the long term. So thank you for your attention. And obviously, I thank very much my sons um, who have taught me a lot over the past 25 years. Thank you so much. minutes of question and answer from the audience. Uh, very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. It was a very complimentary what with the talk of uh, Professor Klass. And uh, so, the microphone is, is coming. Thank you very much for beautiful and stimulating talks. Um, one question uh, to you. Um, I saw uh, lots of mothers and uh, not many fathers in your pictures. Uh, has it been studied, investigated, or because in fact it, it's something that's very easy to foster a parity that the father reads to the child. And uh, I didn't see that uh, mentioned or stressed in your talk. Can you develop it? 
Um, is this on? Yes. Okay. So it's an excellent question. I have to remind you that I come from the only wealthy nation in which there is no mandated maternity leave, let alone paternity leave. So when I'm looking at the people who bring small children into my office, there are pressures on the family in terms of who is there to talk to me. So I think that's one thing that you see, is that frequently the people who we actually have with us there are the mothers when the children are young. There is actually a body of research on the importance of children hearing the different vocal registers. Children who hear reading aloud as children who hear speech in the different registers, um, women's voices, men's voices, have a, a richer and more important experience. We've also tried very particularly, we have a program that works with parents when the children are born prematurely and spend time in the newborn intensive care unit. So you have the parents waiting there. We've had programs trying to encourage those parents to read with the children. And in particular, we've seen very strong effects on the fathers and on the opportunity to do something with your voice for a child who in some cases you can't even pick up or touch. So I think it's tremendously important. Um, I think we've tried really hard to find books and stories which work well, which reflect the important role of both parents. But I also think that when we take pictures of who's in the pediatric exam room, we often see a lot, often the mothers. Okay. Other questions? Um, is there a difference between computer screen or books? Because uh, a lot of people say that books and paper will disappear. So. Well, the problem of the computer screens is that they <coughs> emit blue light. And uh, the problem is that usually blue light shifts the sleep phase into the night. So analog paper books do not have this effect. Um, so I rather recommend uh, parents to use books than uh, iPads, simply because of this, because of the um, because of the light, the light is a problem. There are actually some really interesting studies looking at parents and young children reading the same story on a tablet and on the page. And one of the thing, and, and when you look at these studies, and they, the, so first of thing I should say, having, being able to have books on the screen actually opens up a lot of possibilities for many families, especially as children get older. Um, we need books in all kinds of languages. It's possible to have all kinds of accessibility. It's possible for people who don't have much money to find their way to all kinds of wonderful resources. But if we're talking about six-month-olds, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, bedtime stories, then paper is a very remarkable technology. When you study parents and one-year-olds or two-year-olds and they're looking at the same story on a tablet, all of their interaction is about who controls the tablet. It's not about the story. It's not about the characters. It's not about what's happening. It's about who presses the button, who turns it on, who turns it off. It's, you know what two-year-olds are like. Um, Six-month-olds eat books. They wrestle with them. They have to learn to turn the pages. There's a lot of, of touch and tactile and manipulation skills. I don't know what you would say, but none of the families that I work with are worried that their children will not be skillful with touch screens. Their children will be supremely skillful with touch screens. They will surpass their parents. But the tactile skills of handling a book are something different. I, I can't more than agree what you said. 
Any other question? Please. È opportuno che ci siano dei posti dove i bambini possano essere a contatto liberamente con i libri. L'unico esempio che io conosco è la biblioteca di Mendrisio, estremamente accogliente. Che so, ieri pomeriggio pioveva, ma ce n'erano tanti al pian terreno, potevano fare tutto quel che volevano. Però sono in mezzo ai libri, li frugano lì. Tutta un'altra vita. È l'unica biblioteca che io conosco così. So I wondered whether the question might also be for, for you. Having sì, capisco, ma forse... Sì, in effetti la, la, la biblioteca di, di Mendrisio, la Filanda, è un esempio, eh, diciamo così, eh, virtuoso, ma non solo in Ticino, ma anche in tutta la Svizzera. È una biblioteca aperta praticamente tutta la settimana, con orari molto, molto estesi. Eh, la, tra l'altro la parte eh, dedicata ai bambini è, è curata in modo particolare anche dalla, dalla, da, da Bibliomedia. Però devo dire che sul territorio della Svizzera italiana esistono tantissime biblioteche, biblioteche per ragazzi, per bambini, che sono gestite eh, dal volontariato, ma che eh, si... Sì, <coughs> si occupano anche moltissimo eh, della, della parte dei bambini dai 0 ai, ai 5 anni, proprio anche grazie all'introduzione all di questo progetto in Ticino e in Svizzera. E da, dagli studi che, che, che abbiamo fatto ci siamo accorti come eh, c'è stato un grande incremento da, in quasi tutte queste biblioteche di, que di genitori che portano i bambini in questa fascia d'età. Yes, I think that uh, the libraries, like museums, have to change their mission from object-oriented to experience-oriented. So uh, they can become a, a center for the, for the health and also for the, 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 the development of the children. So we must uh, give a prize to Mendrisio Library for this. Any other question? I was going to say, I think also for us, many parents feel very isolated when their children are young. Um, again, it may be different from country to country and area to area, but many parents are not in their large extended families. Many parents are on their own, and uh, libraries can also be a place where people connect with each other, where you know that if you go with a small child, you'll find other people with small children, where you can create a, a, a sense of community. Shared reading is, we uh, have understand, understood uh, this, this evening, is uh, extremely important for the the health and the normal uh, development of typical developing children. But since 10% of the children in the population are affected by different kind of uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, what about this uh, uh, section of the population? There are systematic studies on this, top on this topic or we miss uh, some uh, knowledge? So I would say the most important thing for parents who are taking care of a child who has special needs, neurodevelopmental needs, developmental differences, often for those families, the most important thing is to have some time just to enjoy the child and to enjoy being with the child, right? So we don't want to talk about reading aloud is one more therapy for a child who already gets three or four or five kinds of therapy. We want to talk about Stay everything that you talked about, being together, yeah. being together at night, enjoying the contact, don't you think? Yes, we should not have the idea that reading aloud, reading with the children ha has the main aim to stimulate the child to, to optimize cognitive or language development. No, we should have the idea that reading aloud is a very important time together with the children. And that holds for every child, whatever 
whatever kind of child it is. But on the other hand, when we looked at the children with developmental disabilities, for example, very important if there's a picture book for there to be children, some children in the picture book maybe who are in wheelchairs. Or maybe there's a child who is old enough to want a complicated story but still needs pages that are easier to turn. So it can't just be babies on the page. But, you know, you want books that, that work for many different groups of children. So other, other question? The, probably the last question, because we are uh, over time. Thank you very much for the, the conference. Uh, I'd like to know something about the language, another language. For, is if there is an, an age important to begin to, to, to read in another language, a different language. So for us, the most important thing, all, we, many of the families we work with in the United States are not English-speaking families. And the most important message always is for the parents to read in whatever language is most comfortable. Um, I, when I was first in pediatrics, I had, I worked with a, I had a, there was a baby I took care of who was not talking. And the mother, who was a recent immigrant, wanted very much for the baby to learn English and succeed in school in America. So she wasn't talking to the baby, and she showed me she had written out a schedule of educational television, only educational. And she had the baby in front of the television all, a lot of the time, learning English, she kept saying, learning English, and the baby wasn't talking because babies don't talk unless you talk to them. And so the message for us has always been, you know, read in whatever language is most comfortable. Your baby is a genius. Your baby will learn, your baby will do what I can't do, right? Your baby will speak two languages, three languages perfectly. So the important thing is to read and to talk, and we know that for children who are growing up with more than one language, the more complex vocabulary and syntax that they're exposed to in the first language they hear, the better their brains will be for learning the other languages. Yeah, read and speak with the language of your heart. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that we can now close uh, the evening. It was a very interesting uh, appointment. We are very happy. Thanks to Professor Klaas and thanks pro to Professor Yenny. And thanks also to the actress to for the, his, his reading. Uh, the next appointment is uh, always on reading, but uh, in uh, for the aged people, for to prevent uh, the cognitive uh, impairment and maybe also dementia. And so uh, I, I am waiting for you uh, on uh, November 6th. Okay, see you, see you soon, bye. <laughs>